All right, so we're in chapter 55, which is called The Purification of the World and Humanity in the Judgment. The first section is entitled The Warning Voice of God and Nature Before the Judgment. Stacy, you want to read verse 1? Verse 1. I have said that a very great ordeal draws nearer to mankind, so great that in all the history of its centuries and ages, it has not had any comparison. Now, that's one thing that we learn about the so-called tribulation, these seven years of trouble, is there's, the earth has never seen anything like it. The scripture compares it to the flood that happened so many years ago, but this says that this is even worse. Okay, um, what makes me kind of scary about it, well, I guess I'm kind of scared. I'm kind of scared that this is going to be something that we can't handle. Well, and that's the purpose of the re that's the reason why we're doing this class. So, you know, we can see what you're supposed to be scared of. What is coming, you know? Okay. <laughs> we're going to, uh, this class is probably going to make you more scared after it's over with. Yeah, okay. Number two. Now, you must understand that I am speaking to the heart of all of you. I am allowing my messages and warnings to reach you in many ways in order for man to meditate and to awaken to my law like the prudent virgins of my parable. Yeah, he's, he's talking to us in dreams. He's talking to us in uh, even television and movies and stuff. There, there's a lot of different, we're getting a lot of different um, uh, avenues that he's using to give us hints that this thing is coming, that, you know, that, you know, we need to be paying attention. For a lot of us, it's working. For a lot of us, it's not. Yeah, so when he's talking about the virgins, he's talking about it's time now to start getting your oil together. Right. You remember the story of the ten virgins there? They, uh, um, the half of them had the oil. The other half of them didn't. And what we learn now is that the oil that he's talking about is what is the... the is the, it the laws? It's the law, yeah. It's, it's the Old Testament stuff. It's all of that stuff we were supposed to, you know, all of those those uh, statutes, judgments, commandments, and all that stuff we were supposed to learn in the Old Testament is the oil. And that's the thing about the virgins is they're waiting for the Messiah to come back, for the king to come back, you know, But and they're all standing there at the gate. But when the gate opens and, and the, the bridegroom is back, they have to now go back and, what, read the Bible? Mm, it's also talking about, uh, well, is it talking about your merits as well? Yeah, it's talking, well, yeah, I guess it would be anything, that could, because it, the oil is not defined. It's not defined what it is, but it's, it, it definitely has something to do with the word, but sure, it can have something to do with merits. Anything that you need in order to go into the, 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 um, the marriage supper, and merits is one of the things you need to go into that marriage supper. Great. Will the peoples and the different nations of the world listen to me? Will this people to whom I am manifesting myself in this manner listen to me? Only I know, but my responsibility as a father is to put all the means of their salvation along my children's path. See, you got to understand, as our father, he has been trying to get us ready for this event that's about to take over the world. He, he put his word down here for us, you know, including all kinds of apocryphal books. And there's a lot of scripture out there that talks about the events that's about to take place. And, you know, so what he said, uh, is anybody going to listen to him? You know, and, but only he knows, you know, there's a lot of people now who seem to be rejecting the father. But what they're actually rejecting is some of the mistruths that we hear when, you know, people try to, to interpolate the Bible and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, but when it comes down to all those people really going to listen to him, some of them will. Some of them are going to flip. Some of the atheists that you see now are, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be Bible thumpers. Verily I say to you that if any, verily I say to you that if at this period men do not cleanse the blemishes that they have left in their spirit, the elements will come as heralds announcing my judgment and my glory and purifying mankind of all impurity. See, this is why I think this chapter 55 class is so important. People really want to know what's going on. Why is the world getting so harsh and why does it seem like it's getting worse instead of better? Is because of this cleansing period here. And see, what does it say right here? 
See, it's talking about the cleansing of the blemishes that have been left in the spirit. Um, these are these are errors that we've made. These are things that we've done, you know, all through our life, probably because of our ignorance, where we've made mistakes, where we've offended, you know, um, the, the father and in, in, by breaking his laws. And we've offended our brother because we didn't have a you know understanding of all of the things we were supposed to be doing as far as you know how to love our brother. The, these blemishes and stuff that we have, if they're not cleansed now, what does he say? The elements will come as heralds announcing my judgment and my glory and purifying mankind of all impurity. So we have the elements to worry about to come in to 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 help cleanse some of this stuff away, to help get rid of some of these. These bad things that we've done. Okay, what do you mean by the elements? Well, we're gonna find out later that we're talking about stuff like volcanoes, earthquakes, right. even meteors or asteroids, or we're talking about diseases. We're talking about um, all kinds of of things that we can see now in the news. You can see this stuff going on in the news. This is Judgment Day. Judgment Day is not 24 hour period. You know, it's more closer to a thousand years. But we can see this stuff going on now. And it's never really gone on before. People haven't really experienced earthquakes and all of that kind of stuff. When you read the the, um, the Old Testament and the New Testament, you rarely hear about earthquakes and volcanoes and hurricanes and all of that stuff in the Bible. This is all new stuff, you know, that's going on and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's increasing. It's getting worse. Well, that makes sense that the um, elements will purify you because when you have a hurricane coming or you know that it's in the vicinity or whatever, uh, and it actually comes in and destroys uh, things in your life, then it will impur you know, you will be calling on the Father's name, you will be seeking him and different things of that nature. Yeah. You're right, you're right. Number five, blessed are the men, women, and children who, upon realizing the proximity of that justice glorify my name insisting that the day of the Lord has arrived because their heart will tell them that the end of the reign of evil draws near I say to you that these people through their faith their hope and their good deeds will be saved but how many of those will live during those days are going to blaspheme yeah now this is kind of a long verse let's take it a little bit slower it says blessed are the men women and children who upon realizing the proximity of my justice glorify my name talking about now blessed are those who looking at all of this stuff that's going on in the world and say boy what's that don't they not hear something in revelations then i hear a preacher talking about how you know the tribulation is supposed to be maybe this is the tribulation so blessed are those who who who, you know, what it says, up on realizing the proximity or the closeness of, of judgment, they glorify his name, you know, turn to him, you know, not really talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Remember that the name of the father has to do with his word, you know, and those who pick up his word and, 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 and call on, call on him in that manner. Sensing that the day of the Lord has arrived because their hearts will tell them that the end of the reign of evil draws near. Yeah, see, that's one thing we have to learn, Stacey. You jump in any time, but that's one thing we have to learn is that evilness is going away. There isn't going to be no more evil after the tribulation. So these would be who you would call the watchers? Um, yeah. They're watching for, uh, watching and sensing that something is coming. Yeah, well, when you say watches, I thought of angels, but those that are on watch, those yeah. that, are, yeah, yeah, the, well, yeah, I mean, those are the people who know what the scripture says or know somewhat what the scripture says about how things are supposed to be, and they're looking around and they kind of see, yeah, this is kind of lining up, yeah, you're right, especially stuff like Matthew 24, you start to see those events going on, a lot of people are going to be awakened and, you know, start to move in the right direction. So I say to you that these people, through their faith, their hope, and their good deeds, will be saved. But um, how many of those people who lived during that, those days are going to blaspheme? And this part right here, I say to you that these people, through their faith, their hope, and their good deeds, will be saved. Now, this is Hermes Academy. We teach scripture. We teach virtues. We teach this stuff. You can find classes on, you know on faith, on hope, and good deeds. We did a class on merits and how um, good deeds or charitable deeds are necessary for in our spiritual journey. It helps us to get closer to the Father. And we're going to have to be close to Him during this period. 
We're going to have, during this tribulation period, we're going to have to move closer to him or we're going to perish. Those that don't look what he says, but how many of those who live during those days are going to blaspheme? You know, they're, they're going to say that the Lord is harming us, that the Lord is doing this, that, you know, why, why, why is he punishing us in this manner? We're going to learn in this chapter. You guys stay tuned. We're going to learn a lot of stuff in this chapter, but we're going to learn that it's not him that's doing this. He's not the one that's bringing all of this, this trouble. He's not shooting nuclear bombs at us. He's, he's not doing this. It's us that's doing it. The way I understand it, we are trying to harm each other. And in our harming of each other, the earth is being offended. The same way it was with Cain and Abel. Remember the, the book of uh, Adam and Eve where, you know, the earth spit the, spit the body back up on the ground. When Cain tried to bury Abel, the earth spit it back up. And, you know, it was the father who had to come in and, you know, to basically tell the earth to allow this person to be buried. The earth had a problem with it, but we have been burying people all of this time. All of this, ever since Cain and Abel, we have been killing people and burying them in the ground. And the earth is going to get us back, too. So you have man and then you have the earth that's going to come back and, and let man know that, you know, your, your, your weapons are... Ain't 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 that ain't that big and ain't that powerful. Number six. The paradise of the first people became a valley of tears, and now it is a mere valley of blood. That is why today when I have come to fulfill the promise that I made to my disciples, I awaken mankind from their lethargy, giving them my teachings of love to save them, and I seek the spirits who are destined to arise during this period to give testimony of my manifestation and my word with their deeds. Be some long verses sometime. But that he's talking about it's talking about a little bit how out of the or referencing the flood here. Uh the paradise of the first world that was talking about the Garden of Eden. Where when he first put us down here, uh we had a connection with him. We were living, you know, um um in in a garden type environment. But it was through our actions, you know, thanks to the fallen angels, you know, it, it became a valley of tears where ever since then we've been fighting. We've been shooting and killing each other, you know, but this now is a mere valley of blood, meaning people are going to die. There's a lot of people about to die in this in this upcoming tribulation period or ongoing tribulation period. There's a lot of people going to perish. I'm looking at where it says that in the next one it says that is why today when I have come to fulfill the promise that I made to my disciples I awaken man from their lethargy because we're, we've gotten complacent yeah it's talking about how we're asleep everybody right now is asleep um, um, I talked to somebody he said about 90% I think it's more closer to 90% of people are completely unaware of what's going on we find out these people who are unaware of what's going on are the same people who are unaware of all of the scripture. They don't they don't really pay a close, they don't pay attention to anything that's going on in the scripture, and that's why they're missing this. But you know they're they're going to be awakened. We're going to wake up from that. I remember um, not too long ago, a couple of months ago, you said you had spoke to um, a young young gentleman. Probably I think he's about maybe about 23 something like that. Well, he said that he had never even heard of tribulation. Well, that's a lot of people I talk to. Um, a lot of people have never, they don't, they don't even know anything about the tribulation. They know nothing about revelations. They know nothing about what's going on. When it comes to the young millennial age people, I'm going to say most of them don't. These are the people who, at this point, they've given up on church. They, they want nothing to do with the, the, the church be, because... They they they're really smart. They're they're really they're they're, they're, they're uh, the millennial age group is a uh, they, they're a really different group. They're really in tune to everything that's going on, and they kind of see a lot of falsehood in the church. So they're rejecting the church altogether. So those of us who spent you know a few days in church here listening to the Bible thumper you know tell us about you know fire and brimstone, they don't even have that. They don't even they don't have anything. They don't have nothing. They, it's like they they believe that, you know, here it is 2019. 
they, you know, they, they fully expect to be doing exactly what their moms and dads are doing 30 years from now, you know, going down to the job, you know, uh, working nine to five, you know, getting a paycheck, bringing it home, you know, watching TV. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue that any of this is going on. Trump is just an anomaly. Like they go, they go, you know, about two to six years, we're going to get him out of office and then everything will go back to normal. That ain't going to happen. Trump is the last president that will ever be in America. But that's a different class. Let's go on. Number seven. When those chosen by me find themselves reunited round my law, the earth and the stars will be shaken in the sky. There will be signs. Because of that instant, the voice of the divine spirit surrounded by the spirits of the just, of the prophets and the martyrs, will judge the spiritual and material Rams. Talking about the prophets, the martyrs, these are the people that we've killed all of this time. But, you know, um, if you look right here, it, what it said, these will judge the spiritual and, and material realm. Yeah. Go back up there to the beginning of verse 7. When those chosen by me. Now, we did a class on this. Um, um, if you look up 55 verse 7 um, in, in, in you know our channel there, you can find a, a, a pretty good class that we did on this one verse by itself but when it's talking about it's talking about the divine envoys here the one the 144 it's talking about um those people who are not sleep at this time those people who are not um totally you know caught up in the world you know living for our pleasures and and such but are actually paying attention to what the bible says now, these people look odd in 2018, 2017, and 2016 when everything is, is just, you know, plucking along all nice. Why are these people, you know, doing something so odd like following what the Bible says? But these are the people that are chosen by the Father. And what they're doing is they are reuniting themselves or, or the Father is reuniting them around the law. And when you read this verse very closely, when these people... 144,000 or probably more but when they get reunited when you when he has enough of his people reunited with their hands to the plow so to speak what does it say the earth and the stars will be shaken and in the sky there will be signs that's a huge earthquake that's what he's talking about right there is some huge events that are going to go on the earth and the stars will be shaken how are you going to shake both the earth and the stars mm -hmm. That's a serious, that's a serious daily mode right there. But, you know, we, we got that to look forward to. And it's, talk, it's probably about halfway through the tribulation. But I think it talks about it here. It says, because at that instant, the voice of the divine spirit, surrounded by the spirits of the just, of the prophets, and of the martyrs, will judge the spiritual and material realm. Yeah, so, and that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the Father's people to be reunited around his law. Number eight. Many people have fallen to the depths of the abyss of materialism, and others are yet to succumb. The pain of their fall, however, shall waken them from their deep slumber. Yeah. So, talking about the depths of um, the abyss, he's going to explain what that means. There, it's kind of like hell. But you, but you, and not really the hell that we've learned about in the church where it's a place that you go after you die. It's kind of like a, a, a hell on earth kind of thing where, you know, we're caught up in, you know, all kinds of darkness and pain. What does it say down here in verse 9? Pain, vice, and misery we're going to learn about. Matter of fact, go ahead. Number 9. Those are the nations that after a period of splendor tumbled into the abyss to sink into the darkness of pain, vice, and misery. Now, it is not a people, but all of humanity that runs blindly towards spiritual death and confusion. Right. So, you know, we, we are living in, like you say, liturgy. We're living in where we are unaware of the events that are taking place in our world. Although we should be. We should be aware of these events that are going on. We, we are not. Now, you see, eight, what eight is talking about is how people have fallen into materialism, where we... You know, are focused on those things that we can see, touch, and feel more than in spiritual stuff, like you know, 
brotherly love and relationships with the Father and prayer and such. We we are materialistic people, but it says the, is these materialistic people, those of us that are materialistic, are the ones who, or it says, and others are yet to succumb the pain of their fall, however, shall wake them from their deep slumber. So, if we're, what this is talking about is how all of the stuff that we have built up all of this time, talking about our cars, our houses, our, you know, big screen TVs and all of that. When this stuff comes tumbling down on us, you know, talking about that earthquake up there in verse 7 or wherever, it's, it's, that's what's going to help wake us up from the slumber. All of a sudden, you don't have these, you know, cell phones that keep you distracted and, you know, all of this stuff, this computer that, you know, you know, I like to play on or whatever. It's not going to be so handy anymore. And that's what's going to help wake me up from my slumber. It says, those are the nations that after a period of splendor, splendor, see, we're living in splendor now. You know, some of us are falling out of splendor faster than others, but we live in a, in a world now where we can do whatever we want. Man, man, Stacey, we were just talking about a few minutes ago, who are the hungry in this world? Right. We were saying that we don't know any hungry people. Made up or in reality. We can't even think of any groups of people that are hungry. You know, everybody's getting some form of aid from somewhere. The homeless people, the the orphans, the widows, um, even the wino gets food stamps or some something that helps him eat every month. And, you know, here in America, I, I think it's kind of hard to find somebody that's actually hungry and don't have food or adequate food to eat. So are we saying that that's a bad thing? Well, yeah, well, you have to realize that we're living in a Egyptian style culture. It was never supposed to be like this. We was never supposed to buy food from the store. We was never supposed to spend all of our days working to make dollar bills so that we could take those dollar bills down there and, you know, buy food that somebody else has grown. That's an Egyptian type culture. It started there when Jacob uh, sent his 12 sons into Egypt, you know, because of the drought or whatever. If you look at history before then, there was never such thing. There, there was nothing like that going on. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they always grew their own food and, and, and you know, took care of themselves. It was only after that drought that we moved into this Egyptian kind of place. That's why we have all those Egyptian symbols on, on our dollar bill is to let us know where we live. Where we live now is where you have to have money in order to eat, sleep, go to the bath. You can't do anything without money now. And, you know, so that ain't right. That's the way it's not, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And the, the end result is we've put all of our faith in our money. Money is our God now. We can't do anything without money. The same way the Lord promises to take care of our, our health care. He promises to take care of our security. He promises to take care of, you know, you know, all of these things. We now can pick up our pocketbook and by get it ourselves. We ain't got to wait on the Lord for nothing. We can go. If we get sick, we can go to the doctor. If we, you know, feel like our home ain't secure, we can, we can go get ADT and get a security system at or go buy a dog or whatever. We have spending power to where we don't need the father anymore. So we think. So, yeah, it is kind of bad because it's, it's taking it's taking our mind off of him. It, if it wasn't for the fact that it was taking our mind off of him, it wouldn't be such a problem. But like I say, money is our God now. It says, um, these are the nations that after a period of splinter tumble into the abyss to sink into darkness. Darkness being, or what is it, darkness of pain, darkness of vice, darkness of misery. Now it's not a people, but all of humanity that runs blindly towards the towards spiritual death and confusion. And that's an added word right there. You see how those those mm -hmm. are brackets. So sometimes I like to read them both ways. But all of humanity that runs blindly towards death and confusion. Yeah, see that word shouldn't even be there. Right. Because we ain't talking about spiritual death and spiritual confusion. We talking about real death. We're talking about nuclear blasts and you know earth opening up and uh, category six hurricanes and twelve point oh earthquakes and such. It's gonna be some serious dying. It's be, and, and the spirit never dies anyway. That word shouldn't be in there. This right here, what we're looking at, guys, is the third testament of the Bible. Um, we. 
found this PDF version at JesusComes.com. It does belong to a particular religious group. I have to say that because it it um, translation because well, that it just translates just like any scripture. You know, somebody had to translate it from the original language. This one wasn't written in English either, so we have translation errors. And while the translator, you know, sometimes takes the liberty to do stuff like this by adding this word in here but you know we find that in the King James Version too they have those little brackets in the King James Version too that's where I learned them at but let's go on number 10 the arrogance of the people shall be touched by my justice remember Nineveh Babylon Greece Rome and Carthage in them you will find profound lang lessons of the divine justice now I look some of these places up Nineveh Babylon Greece and Rome Carthage these you know, there, there seems to be a common thread here. You know, one of the main thing is that this was a um, civilized government who happened to have the father's people living in their in their towns, in their places. Like Nineveh, Nineveh was that was like um, Syria or Syria, and that just happened when when they fell. The, the the Messiah's people were living there, same way it was when when Babylon fell. You know, you know, um, it was Nebuchadnezzar's son who was the king of Babylon at the time, and you know, so you know, we're talking about Meshach, or what? Who was it? I can't think of their names. Daniel. Da Daniel and all of them guys were even still there when they got invaded. So we're talking about governments that houses the father's people. That's America now. That's England now. That's, you know, that's uh, Great Britain now. That's all of these places where the Father's chosen seed lives and dwells amongst these other nations, amongst these other people. You know, the Father's seed here in America, the Father's seed is a minority group amongst the rest of these people in America. And they have rulership on them. And that's what, that's what it was like in Greece and Rome. And... He touched them. He came in and he harmed those uh, government, uh, I want to call them beast systems. He harmed them and released his people out of there. Not, not too much different than what happened in Egypt where he came in and put the thump on Pharaoh and all these people walked free. That happened in, in just about all of these people. It's like a common thread. Levin says, when man, upon grasping the scepter, have allowed their hearts to fill with impiety, pride, and insane passions, dragging their peoples into the degeneration. My justice has come to remove them from power. Yeah, so grasping the scepter, meaning once they became kings, they thought they could do whatever they want. They, for, they forgot that there was, you know, a father. they like Nebuchadnezzar, where they walk out there and they're like, look at what all I've created with my own hands for my own benefit to show my own glory. And, you know, they lost it. They lost tune with the father, and once and when they did that, they started thinking they could just do whatever they wanted to people. Just you know, if they want to enslave them, if they want to bomb them, if they want to gas them, whatever they want to do, you know, like you know, Hitler kind of crap goes on in these places, and then comes the father in there to, to harm them. That's one of the things that were promised in you know in the scripture, is that in the end times, you know, this this new Babylonian and Egyptian culture is going to turn on the father's people. It's going to turn on them. Think about it now. They don't know who they are. Mm -mm. So, so they're not going to know why they're being harmed. Ready? Twelve. At the same time, however, I have ignited a torch before them to illuminate the road of salvation for the spirit. What will become of men if in the moment of their trials I abandon them to their own devices? Meaning he gave us his scripture. He gave us the word. See, you know, you know, as a, as, as a, a minister, a third era minister, you know, we have to learn to be humble. We're not like the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug where, you know, we sit up haughty and, you know, everybody dotes over us all day. And if, if you don't know, you come in and you say something that we don't like, you know, we got the deacons and, you know, everybody else to kind of put you in your place. You know, in, in the third era, we have to learn to be extremely, extremely humble. So, you know, you say what you want to say about me, but 
the the scripture is our salvation. The scripture is what's put here to help us to to get through all of this. So, you know, if you want to say coach in the fight, don't know what he's talking about. That's fine. But don't talk bad about the scripture because that's what he put here to help us survive this thing is the word of God. It has instructions on what we're supposed to do to survive. It reminds me of how um, when the um, when we were coming out of Egypt that the father had a light to shine to guide us through the way. And now this this quote unquote torch is the word of God. It, it it teaches us and shows us um, the road, like it says, the road of salvation or the spirit. Number 13. From preps Well, before we go on, look, right, look what it says up there. What will become of men if in the moment of their trials I abandon them to their own devices? Meaning, as the world, we found out in the what, very first part, very might be the first verse that we're about to come up on something that the earth has never seen. The earth, the tribulation is going to be the most severe, devastating, catastrophic events that this earth has never seen. Well, what would it be like if he didn't, if he just left, if he was just gone, he didn't give us anything? Well, you know, to just leave us on home. Well, the answer is we'd all die. We'd all die. Okay, I'm going to need help with this P word. A precipice? From precipice to precipice. Man has descended spiritually to the point of denying me and forgetting me, even to the extreme of denying himself and disowning his essence, which is his spirit. Yeah, so we, we, we've we gotten away where we don't even believe, you know, God is real. You know, a lot of people don't believe, you know, in God at all. Uh, and and it's, it's odd how many people, you know, don't believe that he exists today. But, you know, we've gone further than that is what he's saying here. We've gone further than that where people are saying that they don't even have a spirit. They, you know, they, they don't, there's, there's no spiritual side to humanity. They're all materialistic beings. Now, the reason why they do this is so that they can uh, do what they want to other people. If there's no God, if there's no spirit, then that makes us like animals. And so, like I was watching, you know, uh, a little video on meat birds and where you know the meat industry and how these birds are treated <laughs> that's the way we can treat humans the same way them little bitties pop out of them shells and you know we start them on a process to eating them that's the way we can start doing with babies you know just you know we don't have to you know we don't have to take into account that we're dealing with a human if there's no spirit and there's no father no these people are, you know like cattle like very smart animals that you can talk to and tell them, you know, go sit down and wait till we come slaughter you. I think it's just amazing uh, that when we were uh, younger, how people would, wouldn't dare say that they didn't believe in the Father. Now it's a bold thing, you know, like you said, denying me and forgetting me. But they're, like you said, they're even to the point where they, you know, nobody even wants to hear about spiritual things or, or spirit talking about spiritual things is a no no or whatever. It's like they it's, it's, it's like it's, it is it is like it is uncool to believe in the father or the creator. It's like, you know, it's cool to be an atheist and blasphemous or whatever. Right. You know, if it wasn't for this word I'd punch a bunch of them in the mouth. I don't I don't like that kind of stuff. But you know, um we'll let him do it, you know. We'll let we'll let we'll let the father take care. Of it's him. like it's cool to believe in another deity. That's the end thing now. Another deity like what? Like uh, different gods. Oh uh, yeah, like the the fanciful gods. Yeah, yeah. you're right. You know, mm -hmm. they pick pulling at the same old gods from the past, and now we worship them instead of you know the father created. Mm -hmm. yep. <sighs> Number fourteen. Only my mercy can allow man. To avoid the pain of having to retrace the road to return to me. Only I and my love shall know how to put in the way of my children the means of their encounter to the path of salvation. Yeah, so only him. I can't speak on it much because, you know, only he really knows, you know, what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. The, the main thing we have to understand is that he's going to do it on an individual basis. I'm not going to get the punishments due for somebody else, for my daddy or for my sister or for my child. Nuh-uh. 
everything that's going to come on me, everything that's coming on me now and that is going to come on me for the rest of this tribulation period is stuff that's, that's targeted for my spirit, stuff that I need. You know, if it's an ailment or injury or, you know, a loss or whatever, it's because of, you know, that what I did and what I need to get, to get back to, you know, what I need in order to cleanse my spirit so that I can be saved. It's all individual now. 15. The day the waters ceased to cover the earth, I caused the rainbow of peace to shine in the heavens as a sign of the pact God had established with men. Yeah. So what did, what did the rainbow, the rainbow signifies that he would not flood the earth anymore? Correct, yes. And so... He put that rainbow up there as a as a reminder of the um, he called it a pact here, but it was a covenant that he made with Noah. It's called a Noahic covenant or something like that. Um, and that that rainbow is still there. It's going to be a big part of what's to come, you know, but it's still there. I tell you now, you humanity in the third area that you are the same ones who passed through those ordeals in which you were purified. You are soon to experience new chaos. Right. So this is the third this is the third testament, guys. This book is real deep here. One of the things is that we learn is that we are spirit beings housed in material bodies. These spirit beings have dwelled on this earth in, in previously. In other words, we have had past lives. You know, we see that kind of fanciful stuff in the movies and we think it's all about the movies. Now it turns out it's real, and in those past lives, we've actually done things, like I said, against the Father and against each other, that now have to be purified. Every stain that we've ever did has to go away. It has to be clear. It has to be purified. If I've done something in a different life and I thought I got away with it, I didn't. You know, I'm gonna have to pay for it in this life. This is Judgment Day. After after this era, it's over. You know, I'm, I will have, you know, made retribution for every sin that I've ever committed in all of the past lives, all the way back to the flood. And that's what he's saying here. You have gone through this kind of stuff before. What does he say? I tell you now, I tell you, humanity of the third era, that you are the same ones who passed through those ordeals in which you were purified. Yeah, so you're about to be purified again. You are soon to experience new chaos. Yes. It's a new chaos this time, new kind of stuff. It ain't just water anymore. And I just want to mention that you did a, a great class about um, about the two words, um, reincarnation and resurrection. Right. And so if they would like to go back and look at that class, and, you know, I was listening to, we were listening to the New Testament this morning when the Messiah was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he used that word, and if you would replace that resurrection word with re reincarnation, it just makes so much sense. Right. So re 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 uh, resurrection doesn't really make sense at all. You know, now that we know what it is, you know, I was caught up. I've been a minister for 27 years, and I only recently found out that the word resurrection was a substitution for reincarnation. But when, like you said, when, when we did that class, it was like a wild out moment because resurrection don't make sense. How are you going to bring all of these bodies back up out of the hole? I mean, some of them are missing parts. They, they embalmed every one of them that they buried and some of them they burned. You know, embalming, like we was talking the other day, embalming means they pulled all of your guts out. They liquefied your brains and squirted them out your nose. I mean, you have you have no organs, no brain, no no nothing. Other ones were burnt. They they they've gone through you know the um the the incinerator there. So where are these? How are you? How are they going to be reincarnated? I mean, re resurrected. It doesn't make sense. But reincarnation does make absolute sense. That makes perfect sense. That kind of what we always thinking anyway. You know, people always thought that you know we we you know be reincarnated you know because because you know it just makes sense to me i don't know yeah and what he's saying is that we've been reincarnated once and now and that was to purify those deeds back then and now we're having new we're gonna experience new ones you don't know how many lives you've lived on this planet 
Right. You don't know how many times you've been down here, but what he's saying is that you lived through those fl floods before. Okay. And okay. you might have been here since then. You probably have been here since then. It depends on you know how good a per how good a I gonna say person how good a spirit you were how many times you actually had to come down here and you know live on this earth. But we've been here several times. I don't know much about it. You know, like I said, it's I don't know. I haven't gone over to the spirit world to learn any of it yet, but. Okay, number 17. Sure. But I come to prevent the people instructed by me and humanity in general to whom I have made myself known in this time. Listen, my children, here is the ark. Enter, I invite you. Okay, so what does he mean by come to prevent? I won't get that part. I, I, but I come to prevent the people instructed by me and humanity in general to whom I have made myself known in this era. Prevent what? That sentence don't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway. As if it's missing something. It, it probably ain't. It's probably me. But it says, listen, my children, here's the ark. Enter, I invite you. Now, this is this is getting ready to get real important here. You made it this far into this class. Now, here comes your big, first, big, huge nugget of what in the blank I'm supposed to be doing in this time. We're talking about the ark. You know, how do you survive this trip? How do you survive what's going on? We're going to talk in more detail about what you need to be worrying about surviving from. But when we get into this art here, and he's only going to touch on it a little bit, this is extremely important stuff. And and the art, the art before we jump down in verse 14, you should think about the art that carried Noah through the flood. But you should also think about the art that carried Moses through the desert. Like, wait a minute, they carried that art. The ark didn't carry them. They carried the ark. It's, it, it was a guide. It was something that led them through. So when we think about ark, it's something, um, what we say a lot, like a pillar of, you know, like a, you know, some type of uh, beacon that's going to help us to make it from this side of the tribulation to the other side of the tribulation attack. Okay. For you, O Israel, the ark is the practice of my law. And all who fulfill my commandments in the most perilous and bitter days will find themselves within the ark, strong and feeling protected by the mantle of my love. Okay, so now it's talking about Israel, and you have to define who Israel is. If you think Israel is some people over there in Jerusalem trying to take hold of that city, it ain't. It's not. That's not Israel. At that's not Israel at all. Israel is not a group of people like that. And if it was, you know it wouldn't be that group of people anyway. Because like they said, how did they leave black and then come back white? But, you know, that that is not the group anyway. The group of Israel that he's talking about is a spiritual Israel. Now we're talking about all races, all creeds, all colors of people who have one thing in common. And that's his word. That's that's his that's that's him. Anybody who claims the Father, claims the Creator as their their Lord of their life, is Israel is the Israel that he's talking about. And for them, he's saying that the Ark is what love. Wait a minute. Let's see. For you, O Israel, for you, O Israel, the Ark is, is the, the practice, practice of, of my, my law. law. Yeah. So the practice of the law is the Ark. The same way that, you know, Noah was back there hammering and, and nailing with, you know, building a boat. The hammering and nailing we're doing now is is using the using the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy like a blueprint as we mold our life around what the scripture says. And so that's what we're that's that's what that's how we're building that ark. But that's for Israel. That's for the people who are claiming the father. These are the these are. The faithful people in the world. These are the believers of the world, opposed to those who, who you know, don't believe in in the Father at all. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I, don't know. I guess what my thing would be is okay. You say that these are the Christians. These are the uh, people who who believe, but are they practicing His law? See, I'm trying not to leave anybody out. Mm -hmm. I'm trying not to leave anybody out. They are. They, even though they're not keeping the law, they're still Israel. It, 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 they may not be good Israelites. They may not be awakened Israelites. They may not be on the right path. But if they recognize the Father in heaven as their, their, their Savior, if they recognize the Father and are, are 
attempting to to you know walk according to him if they're claiming they know God and they love God they are Israel it's, 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 I'm trying I'm trying because you know we live in a life where the church has always separated and said you know only the church people are you know going to heaven only people in our congregation going to heaven every other church group is not that's not the case at all you have a lot of people involved in these things of other religions. We're talking Muslims and Jewish people and Jews and, you know, a bunch of people recognize the father creator. It don't necessarily have to be of any particular religious group. What they have in common is a relationship with the most high. Those are that's Israel. And for those people. OK, so. There's some people now looking at this video and they say, well, hey, that's me. I got a relationship with the Most High. Okay, are you in the ark? Okay, just because, you, just because you're Israel don't put you automatically in the law. That's, that's what that's at churchism. That's what, that's what uh, churchianity teach you is all you got to say is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No, in order for you, for us to be in the ark, we have to practice the law. Okay, I understand what you're saying. So you can be a quote unquote Israelite, but you can, but that does not mean that you're in the ark. Yeah, it don't mean you're in the ark at all. You know, it's going to be a whole lot of Israelites outside of the ark, and it's because they are not going to put their materialism down. They're not going to awaken when the hour of judgment pronounces itself. A lot of them are going to ridicule. A lot of them, you know, their faith is based on churchianity instead of, you know, uh, biblical, you know, knowledge. They have the doctrine of devils instead of the doctrine of the, of the father. And they, they are t totally outside of the law. They are Israel, but they are outside of the boat. And the same way when the floodwaters start to, climb, start to rise, they're going to be trying to find their way inside of that, inside of that, inside of the boat with Noah. And it's going to be too late. Mm -hmm. the, it's going to be shut up. And they ain't going to be able to get in. Right. Mm -hmm. As what we were talking about earlier, you know, um, um, with the wise virgins, they're going to have to go back and get the oil. Here's some of that oil that they're going to have to get is the law. They're going to have to go back and read the law. It's sad because they've been talking a whole lot of crap and they've been wasting a whole lot of time. But now they're going to have to go back and they're going to have to start reading. Probably it's Genesis chapter one. Mm -hmm. Talking about Israel, keeping out the law. And he says, and if all who fulfill my commandments in the most perilous and bitter days will find themselves within the ark, strong and feeling protected. Um, by the mantle of my love. So this 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 will be smart. I ain't gonna say smart guys, but these are the guys who you see now, you know, struggling to keep the commandments of the Father when what do you say the most perilous and bitter days when they start when they find themselves aware of the commandments and are able to use these you know these commandments and rules in their life during these perilous and bitter days. They will find themselves within the ark, strong and feeling protected. Mm -hmm. While the rest of the world is in mass chaos with people dying by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions, you know, those who are kept the law will be feeling protected by the mantle of his love. So do you can you say that that's going on now or that's not going to happen until tribulation? That's going on now. Yeah, because I was thinking, you know, I would say that, you know, sometimes uh, when we're going through our most perilous and bitter days or having a lot of tribulations and trials and and stuff like that you, you can feel his love you can feel his protection uh, over you and it does it does comfort you and make it make things go oh, well. mm -hmm. now what about everybody else look at 19 and talk about everybody else and to all this humanity I say again the ark is my law of love all who practice love and charity with their fellow men and with themselves will be saved. Now look at this. All who practice love and charity will be saved. For the rest of humanity. For all of humanity. And to all of humanity. And this, the way it says all of humanity. This may include Israel too. That they have to do this here. But it says to, and to all of humanity. I say again. The ark is my law of love. All who practice love and charity with their fellow man and with themselves will be saved. Now, no, I'm messing this up pretty good, but what does the word saved mean? 
I was thinking that too when you think about save, you're talk you're thinking about right. I don't know. What do the, the word saved mean is a tribulation word. He's talking about those who will be around after the tribulation. The tribulation is a lot of people are going to die in the tribulation from ailments, diseases, you know, all kinds of stuff. Those who survive are the ones who will be saved in order to repopulate the earth. Those who, those few people who will be left on the earth in order to uh, raise the next generation. Because, see, the planet is not going anywhere. Humans are still going to be on this planet and living. But with all these people dying, who's going to be left? Well, those are the people that's, that are saved. Well, that makes sense because the ones who are practicing charity, those who are practicing love, I mean, those are the ones that's who, who needs to be around to okay. help others. I mean, right. those who are not, you know, those who won't give, those who are stingy, those who are not lovable or whatever, who... You know, want it all for themselves. They cause this uh, problem in the first yeah, place. Yeah, why would they be saved? Why would they be here to? Well, and he says yeah. he's getting rid of all that kind of stuff, selfishness. You know, all of the arrogance, all of that stuff is going away in this tribulation. After the tribulation, there will be that, that all of them kind of people are going to be gone. You know, they get offended now, and they're like, well, I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm arrogant, and I'm selfish. Yeah, you're going to be gone. Either you're going to change, or you're going away. That That's the way it is. He's going to use you and people like you to kill each other. They're going to fight against each other. What's odd, what's, you know, poetic justice is that, you know, they, they actually end up killing each other. But let's look at this a little bit closer here. I'm, I'm interested. He says, uh, back up in there, 18, he says... Uh, Israel who practiced the law and who fulfilled the commandments in the most perilous and bitter days uh, will find themselves within the ark strong and feeling protected by the mantle of love so they are in the ark feeling strong and protected while the other ones who practice love and charity with their fellow man and with themselves will be saved so now is there a difference one is in the ark and one is saved now, those that are in the ark, they'll be saved, right? Mm -hmm. They will be protected. I guess what I'm looking, what I'm looking to see here is, is the one. Does Israel have to have this law of love too? Do you need both? Is what I'm looking at here. Do you have to have both? The law and the law of love in order to survive. Is that all? We can come back to that. Well, all right, put it in the comment section what you think about it. Talking about the comparison between Israel and all of humanity. Uh, and, and that we'll come back to that. But like I said, put it in the comments. 20. I have always given you time to prepare and apportion the means for your salvation. Before sending you my justice to receive an accounting from you at the end of an error or phrase. I have shown you my love, warning you, and exhorted you to repentance, reform, and the good. Yeah. So, you know, we, 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 have, we have everything we need. It's just that we are rejecting it. We are rejecting the Father. We are rejecting his word. We, we are not being obedient and taking advantage of what he's put here to help us. But, you know, it's, it's he's given us time. Like you said, he's given us time to prepare. You know, he's giving us time to, he's sending people to help us prepare. But as you said, we reject it. So See where, see where it says, he says, um, before sending you my justice to receive an accounting from you at the end of an error or a phase, I have shown you my love, warning you and exalted you to repentance, reform, and the good. See, this should put you in mind of Moses. It should put you in mind of Noah. Just Noah. Hey, mm -hmm. Noah, you ain't saying nobody but your family. But, you know, it should put you in mind of, of Moses. See, there was a lot of events that went on in, in Egypt that are going to happen now. You know, that's why when you look at the stuff that happened in Egypt then in the book of Exodus and you compare it to what's about to happen in, you know, in the tribulation in the book of Revelations, there's a lot of similarities. You got frogs and boils and, you know, earthquakes and darkness and all kinds of stuff. Well, the, this is some event that, that affects the earth periodically. 
And what he's saying here is that each time this event comes down here and touches the earth, he sends you somebody. So he sent you Noah to save humanity one time. Then he sent you Moses to save the chosen seed another time. Then um, then he sent you the Messiah. There wasn't any, you know, there was there was a small earthquake. Well, I ain't going to say a small earthquake. I don't know how big it was. There was an earthquake, but it wasn't a huge catastrophic event similar to that, what's going to happen now or what happened in Egypt. But... He did send you the Messiah during, during that period of whatever did happen. So each time this thing comes back to this planet, you know, some say it's Nerubu or Nibiru or whatever. Each time this thing comes and affects the earth, he sends us a savior. He sends us somebody. Moses, uh, probably Enoch too. Probably Enoch, Moses, uh, um, and the Messiah. And in, and now he's sending us his word again in this period, or Elijah in this in this period here to to help us get through it. Each time he sends us somebody to help us. Twenty one. Nonetheless, at the hour of justice, I have never presented myself to ask if you have yet repented, or if you have prepared yourself, or whether you remain still submerged in disobedience and evil. See now, this is this is some deep stuff here, because people, especially the followers of the Messiah, often wonder how are these other people able to be so successful. They don't care nothing about each other. They don't care nothing about the word. They don't care nothing about God. They claim to be atheists and all of this blasphemy, but yet they're riding around in luxury cars, living in luxury houses, eating what they want. They got it. They seem to have everything going for them in life. And you wonder. You say, well, how is that possible? How 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 is it? That we have all of the promises that we're supposed to get, but it seems like they got all of the stuff, right? And, it, and the reason why is because we're not being held accountable for the obedience to his law. He's, nobody's getting punished right now. Even though this person may be doing whatever they want to do, unless they get caught by the police, it seems like they're going to get away with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can go do whatever they want. Like I say, as long as they slick enough to get away from getting caught. It seems like nothing happens to him. And that's what he's saying here. Nevertheless, at the hour of justice, I have never presented myself to ask you, have you repented? So it's like leading up to the hour of justice, he, everybody's going to start there at, at the same place. He's, he's not coming and, and I don't know if I'm making any sense. You, we're, not being a, we're not being held accountable before the hour of justice. It's the hour of justice that we're going to be held accountable. And that will be during tribulation. And they do, yeah. That will be, they, when he says hour, when he, when he starts saying hour, he's talking about almost like the very precise thing. Like, like but you have to think, when he said the day of judgment, when, when they say the day of judgment, he was talking about a thousand years. So how long is the hour? If a day is a thousand years, how long is an hour kind of thing? And it could be like seven seven years. You know, it could be spread out. But before that time, we were able to do what we wanted to do. Nobody was being held nobody was being held accountable. I mean, you might have ate, you know, something that, you know, hurt your body or whatever, but it wasn't him that came down and, you know, smacked that pork sandwich out of your mouth, you know. Mm -hmm. The fact that you so you're saying that people just aren't being held accountable to the law right now. Right now, it's not. Right now. Right. But and that that that's what the scripture is for. It's instructions for surviving the tribulation. So, you know, if you choose not, if we choose not to read it and not to have it, then when that hour of justice shows up, we're not gonna know what to do. Mm -hmm. And it's then that we're gonna find ourselves, you know, on the wrong end of that, you know, on the wrong end of the judgment. 22. My justice has arrived at the appointed time, and he who known to build his ark on time has been saved, while he who responded with ridicule and with nothing for his salvation when the hour of justice was announced had to perish. Yeah. So, there's a lot, see, there, a, problem, a problem with the church now, and it, it's a huge misunderstanding is, you know, we look at all of the Bible thumpers, supposedly all throughout history, been saying that the end is here, right? Mm -hmm. Every day the world's about to end. But when you really get deep into how this thing has played out, the Bible didn't become available to the 1600s 
1611 is when the first Bible was actually put into the the uh, bookstores and you were actually allowed to go and purchase one in your own language where you can read it. Before then you had to learn Greek or you never even heard of it at all. So the Bible wasn't around at all before 1600. Only a few people had it. And they were talking Greek, like those Catholic people down at the church. And they were talking about it in Greek. See, people think the Bible's been around the whole time. Well, they've had it all of these years. No, they did not. They did not have it. The only very select few people had access to the scripture. It was always in the hands of the very, very, very few. I'm talking about the priests and the high-level priests at that. Because they were written on scrolls. It wasn't mass production. It was only like one copy for the whole church. You think I'm going to let somebody take it home and read it? I'm sorry. You're not. And so it was not available. So when the preacher man got a hold of it after 1600s, he was already in Judgment Day. He was all, a Judgment Day lasts a thousand years. He was already there. And so he was correct when he said the end is near. The problem with us as a materialistic people is we immediately ran outside and started looking for meteors and boils and, you know, earthquakes and stuff and it's like well it ain't here yet so then we say well he must not know what he's talking about because he said it was supposed to end yesterday and it did that's kind of what kind of what's going on now where people they expected to see it today they went to church that morning sunday morning they got released out of church about noon or whatever you know listening to the bible thumper telling them that the world's about to end the world didn't end by nightfall and they gave up on it like well he must ain't know what he was talking about mm -hmm. But, you know, it says my justice arrived at the appointed time, meaning it don't matter how many, how, how desperately that preacher wanted the world to, you know, want to see something happen. And that is going to happen at the time that it's going to happen, no matter how many years early you are. Mm -hmm. yep. And he who is known to build his ark on time has been saved. Yeah. So building the ark on time. See, he sent out a wave. Um not too many years ago where he tried to call in all of his people you know a lot if you look on it if you look on the web and people you'll find that there was a huge awakening that t has taken place over the last you know three or four years right well this was the people who responded appropriately when you know he sent this thing out i'm not sure how he sent it out but you know i heard it you know when when and how did i hear it i don't know but we started building an ark all of those many years ago and there's a lot of people who are building the ark the ark of love the ark of charity these people are building the ark now and you know hopefully we have you know adequate time and get it all built to to you know you know adequate standards to survive this thing but he says look at and he who what he says while he who responded with ridicule and did nothing for his salvation when the hour of justice was announced had to perish now, how many people are out here ridiculing now? How many lots, people? Lots yeah. of people ridiculing. I mean, you can start thinking, start naming off your family members now. Mm -hmm. You know, you can imagine what the rest of humanity look like. But, you know, you can start picking them off now. The people who are ridiculing obedience to the scripture. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? You know? Yeah. Why would you sit down on the Sabbath day? Everybody's having so much fun on this day. Why would you do that? You're missing the Christmas party. Why would you, you know? It's because we're building the ark in the same way that people were laughing at Noah when he was building that ark. You know, they are doing it now. They are laughing at us build this ark. All right, y'all. It looks like we're getting ready to go into another section. So I believe we're going to take a little bit of a break. Well, you guys don't notice breaks. So we're just going to pause. Hermes Academy. Power, patience, continence, and faith. We teach virtue. 